gateway to the West, Cardinal Nation. St. Louis, Missouri is the home to some of the most brilliant physicians in the world. These doctors are pushing science to its limits, healing patients in new innovative ways and doing it at the same time they are teaching the next generation of doctors how to save lives. Meet Slew Care Radiologist, Dr. Nadine Parker and Slew Care Pediatric Cardiologist, Dr. Wilson King who found a way to print 3D models of aneurysms, heart defects, and other abnormalities in order to aid surgeons who operate on very complicated cases. This is the science of healing. It was about two years ago, uh, we went to a meeting, uh, me and Dr. King. One of the speakers there was talking about uh, 3D printing for patients who have uh, congenital heart disease. And so we're looking at each other and saying, well, maybe you know, this is something that, that we might be able to do here at Cardinal Glennon. The first part was easy to acquire you know, great imaging uh, and then to interpret them. That was the easy part. The second part was to convert these uh, CT and MR images into a file that would be read by a 3D printer. And we started working on that. Uh, we were able to create a model on the computer. And then the third aspect of making the model is to get a printer that would print the model. It turns out that the engineering school, Parks uh, College of Engineering here at SLU, um, they, uh, at the, with aerospace and mechanical engineering, they have a 3D printer. So, so I, uh, I called them up and said, oh, do you think we can try to do this? And, and they're typically used to printing uh, mechanical parts, uh, um, wings, things like that. So they said, well, we're not sure, we, we can try. So we got in touch with the chair of Parks College of Engineering, Dr. Shri Kandor. Nadim and uh, Wilson, I am faculty. I've been in their shoes a long time ago, so I see them next generation leaders. So what we thought in the beginning is we should help them in whatever way we can so that they succeed in their life. He was very enthusiastic about it. Um, he said that we use the 3D printer to make uh, satellite part models, airplane models. Uh, I've never done anything with medical use and uh, if this helps a person, uh, I'll be more than happy to work with you guys. So that's how we got together, uh, myself, Dr. King and Dr. Condor, uh, to start this project. In terms of patient care, 3D printing can be used to provide uh, better images right? rather than just flat images, three-dimensional images that can help convey what's wrong with the patient and help the, the treating physician to provide the best possible care. So the printer, what it does is it takes the 3D model that the doctors uh, map and cuts in layers. So we take these layers and print one layer at a time. So we, the printer puts the main model material and also support material. So if there is some overhang or something that needs to be supported, it creates the support material. When it's all done, we remove the support material. We can wash it off or scrape it off, and then we actually have the model. At Colonel Glennon Hospital, uh, which is our children's hospital, we have a lot of um, cardiac patients that are young and have congenital birth defects. Uh, these are very difficult patients to treat because uh, many of them are tiny individuals. You can imagine how small uh, their hearts are. And we image them uh, for our cardiothoracic surgeons, Dr. Uh, Charles Huddleston and Dr. Andrew Fiore. And we know that a lot of the cases that these guys do are very complex uh, to operate on. And we said, okay, we, maybe we can provide them with a tool by uh, making a 3D printed model. It's just an additional tool to help them. And that's how we made our first model. We had done an MR scan and we were reviewing with them. There's a certain wow factor when you just look at one of these and realize that this is the actual representation of the baby's heart and the defect that it has. I was uh, taken back by the, how accurately they could portray the anatomy in a, in a three-dimensional visual way that 
because when we go to the operating room, it, it, one of the things that's very helpful is to sort of plan your operation ahead of time. And it's like the frames of a movie. I sort of think of an operation as frames of a movie. And uh, one, one picture leads to the next picture. And it's nice ahead of time to be thinking about how you're going to play your movie that morning. One of the things that helps us play that movie correctly and better and more accurately, more precisely, which is the key to our practice to, for success, is, is are these models. It is very easy for me to describe what I see in two dimensions. Um, the surgeons, on the other hand, have a very challenging task. Because we have to take these two-dimensional images and translate them in our mind to the three-dimensional figure because when we're actually doing something structurally to change the heart, it is a three-dimensional job. It's not a two-dimensional change of anything. And having one of these it changes the game as far as having to go through that little transition. Both these surgeons are excellent. They would have probably been able to do the surgeries even without the models. But we said if it is an additional tool, we'll try to make a model for them. So we started printing with a rigid model, and they really liked it. And that's how the project started. So this is the so this is the first heart um, that that we had printed. Uh, so so this is of a, a 14 year old boy um, who had who has very complex uh, heart disease. Dylan needed surgery because he was born with congestive heart failure. We found out that it was a genetic disease that was carried in our family. We've been working for many years as attendings in congenital heart surgery and we had not seen anything quite like this with the combination of anomalies. And it's not easy to go to the literature or textbooks and try to find a direct solution to this problem. Since the first day of life, he was in their hands. And he, the second day he was born, he went in for heart surgery. And he's been, we've been with Cardinal Glennon for 13 years. And they've kept this baby alive. So we had a kind of, this particular case, it was extremely helpful to have the model because there's not a lot out there in the literature to go to to, to understand how to repair this uh, correctly. And so it was particularly useful in this case. It's, I couldn't even begin to tell you what was wrong with his heart, but there was just so many different things. As Dylan grew and got older, they kept saying, well, we can do this when he gets at a certain age. Right now, let's just sustain him and it took them until just now for them to finally figure out this is what we're gonna do. This is, this is different than looking, looking on a screen. This is uh, this different, even looking at a 3D rendering, I think, on a screen, because it's something that the surgeons can hold, uh, they, can, they can rotate, you know, to really try to understand the anatomy. Uh, Dr. Holston and I worked together on this and actually were able to repair this lesion, and it really helped uh, having this model, particularly uh, understanding the spatial relationships inside the heart to redirect the blood. It took actually three patches to inside the heart, three patches inside the heart to redirect the blue and red blood correctly. He is, his heart was one chamber. There was no four chamber, there was no two chamber, it was one solid chamber. And they fixed that. They have done wonders for us. Our miracle baby, definitely. It had helped us quite a bit on, on Dylan. It was really helpful. I thought that heart was pretty neat. It's a very exciting project. We uh, meet regularly. Uh, we see uh, that we are changing the world in a very positive way, and we see we are at the cutting edge of technology. I'll always remember when I first started in my training, professor of surgery that uh, was in charge of the operation would open the heart, look inside, and it just seemed like it took him forever as he just looked at things and I'm thinking, you know, why don't you just go on and start getting to work? And this is a very novice level for me, having not done any heart surgery. I'm just observing, just take all this time to settle in his mind, I'm sure, what this is actually looking like in the three-dimensional picture, having gone into the operating room, a certain preconceived notion of, from the two-dimensional pictures that he'd been looking at previously. So I, you know, I see this as, as short-circuiting that whole process to go through in the first place. And you know, over, as I'm doing it myself, I was doing the same exact thing that he would do. Bristol Carter, at 14 days, had a model printed of her heart to help surgeons operate. When I was um, 
three months pregnant, we went to my OB and she saw that there were some problems potentially. So they sent us to Cardinal Glennon to the Fetal Care Institute. And then of course when she was born, we found out that there was the um, two holes in her heart and then also it wasn't connected like it should have been. So this is uh, showing the uh, aortic the interrupted aortic arch. So typically the aorta is the main blood vessel that comes out of the heart and supplies oxygenated blood to the body. And, um, and so there was an interruption here, so it had never fully formed. Um, there's actually an extra um, blood vessel here that, that goes away uh, when, when patients are, are, are first born. So, um, so, we had, uh, obtained, um, so we had obtained the imaging initially to try to uh, understand uh, you know what the what the gap was to really help the surgeons understand you know how, how to proceed uh, with this with this repair. The first time we saw the model was the day of heart surgery. Um, they brought it in right before they took her back for heart surgery and showed it to us, and it was just a perfect little plastic model of her heart. Had, it was crazy that they could even do that, but it was um, it was really amazing to see that that was the actual model of her heart that we could hold in our hand and it would make it easier for them to do their surgery. They could see everything. To be honest, we, uh, it was the day of her surgery, so when he brought it in and I looked at I wasn't as fascinated with it because I was more concerned about her. And it was li literally right before, I mean her name was up on the board that she's fixing to go in, you know, and I just but then the more I thought about it, the, the, as the day went on, we got to talking about it, you know, as we were waiting for her to recover and all that, that it was, um, it was amazing. They may have helped my baby. And uh, whatever helped her was my concern. And if it could help, I was behind it 100%. This, there's always an issue about the distance that you have to bridge to get the two ends of the aorta together. Uh, and to try to analyze that from a two-dimensional picture is, is at best a guess. With this three-dimensional model, we can just see right where it is and figure out how much distance we need to make up and figure out the best way to reattach it and that sort of thing. It was just a tiny little model of her heart, of her actual heart. This is, this is her heart that we're holding in our hands that they can see, and it's gonna make everything easier for them, yeah. We had it in the operating room. We had, we had the model there, and we, uh, we did use it, and you know, it did certainly help. But also, the hole between the two lower chambers, you know, usually you can approach it through the right upper chamber, but sometimes with interrupted arch, it's, it's better approached through the pulmonary valve. You know, the BSD can be actually closer to the pulmonary valve, and this helped us make that decision uh, how best to approach the patching the hole. As long as we're at Cardinal Glennon, we're fine. <laughs> think yeah, she's well. fine. She's yeah. fine. Doing well. Uh, we got a lot of positive feedback uh, from that, and that's how we started doing this. And from one to the other, and we made another model. Um, then other people started to find out, and they asked us, can you do this for us? Um, like, for example, my friend in uh, neurosurgery, Dr. Salim abdul Rauf, he's a chair of neurosurgery. Uh, he happened to um, run into us in the hallway. We exchanged greetings, said hello, and then he just asked, what's new? and I just happened to have a model in my hand and I just showed it to him. And as I was speaking with him, it just kind of came to me that we do these surgeries on brain aneurysms. And the thing with brain aneurysms is that we see them for real for the first time during surgery. So as I was speaking to him, I felt that were, if there was a way by which we can reconstruct that before surgery, and look at it under the microscope, that would be an advance that would help us in planning the surgery and increase the accuracy of the procedure itself. He does this simulation where he teaches other neurosurgeons and residents in training how to operate on these complex aneurysms. And he said, if I have a model that makes it so much easier, uh, I can put this model under a microscope
and show them exactly what I do with a video recording of my surgery. As things go, uh, I spoke to him in the hallway and I said, uh, Dr. Parker, we have uh, an aneurysm surgery coming up. He, with his team, proceeded and, uh, and developed a model for us. And we really didn't know that we could print such a complicated structure uh, on the printer. And when we started looking at it, uh, we were actually surprised how complicated nature is. And we are able to mimic that on a 3D printing technology. Uh, we made this model initially showing the aneurysm and then we magnified it. I think with the 3D modeling, one of the things we do during surgery is to really understand the environment we're in under the microscope, where all the vessels are, where it's going to be behind what. Having seen that before, now you cut the amount of time that you spend trying to study your environment uh, before you can actually interfere. So now you really know where everything is, is so you can now plan and it moves much uh, smoother. Essentially this is the model as created and we added the coloring to it. And you will see this is the actual physical size of the model itself. The green being the aneurysm, the blue is an important artery sitting on the aneurysm and these are the surrounding blood vessels. I then took the model to the operating room. And with my team, the day before surgery, we put the model under the microscope and studied all the vessels around the aneurysm. That got us ready, then the next day we did the surgery and we could tell right away that clearly there is a benefit of having had that simulation, uh, as they call it in aviation, simulation prior to the procedure uh, so clearly that was something that we felt uh, really would be important uh, to, to take forward. The confidence you get having seen something before you went into surgery. The team also has seen it and everybody is ready for all the things that we're going to uh, encounter. By increasing the safety of the procedure, what is happening is that patients who have these kind of surgeries have very short hospitalizations as compared to when we didn't have all these tools and the patient is here for a long time. Uh, I just did a surgery on an aneurysm two days ago and the patient is going home today. Uh, that is not historically how, how it is done, but it is a combination of all the things we're doing that's making the operation safer, the patient goes home earlier, and everybody's happy. So we make different uh, models with different materials. We make flexible material. People have come and asked us to make hollow models. Uh, we made those as well. For all of these things, uh, the engineering help is uh, very helpful. They're brilliant people and they give us good guidance whether it can be done or it cannot be done. Uh, now people have asked us to make uh, models with material that's sterilizable so that they can hold it in the OR. Uh, while they are scrubbed and if they need to look at it. Uh, I don't think uh, we would have been able to do that without the support from the engineering people because they know these things much better than we do. I have been interested in simulation for a long time, but I did not think I would run somebody in the hallway. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I didn't know exactly what the design would be. And then uh, as uh, he and I worked together, we were able to uh, change the texture, everything to simulate an actual aneurysm and blood vessels in the brain. Other things that you could think of doing is somebody who has orbital fractures, somebody gets punched in the face, um, have fractures of the orbit, you need implants that would take care of the fractures. You could fit the implants in there. You could customize the implant to that particular person's fractures. We're, we're seeing these type of ap applications uh, in plastic surgery, um, in, in orthopedics. So, so I think this is very broadly applicable. So. Dr. Alexander Lin from Slucare Plastic Surgery has been nationally recognized for his expertise in treating complex anomalies of the face and utilizes 3D printed intraoperative models for children with complex anatomy. He is helping Dr. King and Dr. Parker advance the way they print models for pediatric surgery. And you can see where this cuts around and off of the pterygoid bones. These 3D printed models are printed from each child's CT scan, so it is personalized surgery. 
Dr. Lin has three provisional patents pending in 3D printing technologies that will revolutionize the treatment of kids with facial deformities by reducing and even avoiding surgeries. We plan to make models for him uh, so that it can help in his surgery. Uh, we also think that in the future we could make implants for uh, him if he needs them uh, that would fit in those particular patients for cleft palates and the other maxillofacial deformities. 3D printed models are really an important innovation that has happened in plastic surgery and any surgery that requires three-dimensionality. It's almost like thinking about the sequence of innovation from CAT scans that used to be two-dimensional and then CAT scans being reformatted to 3D CAT scans. And those 3D CAT scans are basically sort of like how a video game can show things in uh, three dimensions. And that actually was, a lot of that research was done by a plastic surgeon in St. Louis, Dr. Jeffrey Marsh, uh, who, who also uh, worked with a radiologist who was an engineer, and they actually did a lot of technologies to do that, to make 2D, 3Ds be visualizable as a 3D image and now it's standard. No, no surgeon would say, oh, I don't want to see the 3D reconstructions, just show me the 2D ones and that's good enough. So it's almost a natural extension of that to another level. I think in terms of pediatrics, where anatomy is much smaller and more packed, and for much of what we do in pediatrics, it's genetic anomalies, which are very unusual anatomy. I think those things together, the smallness of the anatomy plus the unusualness of the genetic anomaly or the developmental anomaly makes it an ideal candidate for utilizing this kind of technology, 3D printing. So one of the ways we use it is the 3D printed model is sterilizable and then in the operating room we can use it to real time measure where we're going in the patient's body and so that makes surgery much safer and smoother. And there's so many structures that you can injure, um, uh, especially when we're doing surgery of the jaws uh, and the skull, um, you know, surgery of the skull in this area can injure the, the brain or the eyes, surgery in this area can injure the tooth buds of the teeth and the nerves that make your face move and, and sense. And sense. So. It's a really nice feeling for the surgeon to be in there and to say, it's not just from my knowledge, but I can see that I am going to miss that tooth and we're not going to injure that tooth. Uh, or I'm going to miss that nerve for sure. Or I'm going to miss whatever structure. In a surgery to move the upper jaw, um, we would have to cut back here and across here. Really, the, the areas that we're more concerned about are in the back, uh, where a lot of other structures lie. The branches of the carotid are back here, for example. Um, and so our cutting instruments, I literally can hold this model, and the cutting instrument can be placed exactly where I want to be, and I can mark right at the teeth. So that means when I go on the patient, when, I meet, when the mark is at the teeth, my, the end of my cutting instrument will be right in the, wherever I want it to be. And so then I transfer my instrument into the patient and I have the exact location where I want to be. So that's one of the prime ways an intraoperative 3D printed model can be used to make surgery more precise when you're dealing with a very three-dimensional surgery. Um, as you can see, the, the skull is one of the most three-dimensional shapes we have there. In the old days when all we had were x-rays, they were close to useless because they were taking this and projecting it, a globe, onto a sheet. And it was, I mean, there's so many little bones in a skull. If they can hold it and turn it and look at it, instead of looking at it on paper or on a computer, they can actually hold a model of her exact heart or anything else that they need to make. standpoint of teaching, the 3D printing uh, has tremendous potential because you can uh, actually create a 3D model of various disease processes and have medical students or nursing students or residents uh, work with the model. This is something they can touch and pick up and it, it's a much more effective way of conveying information than just looking at flat pictures. I think it's very, 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 very exciting um, for, for us. So I remember um, learning uh, as, as, as a student, you know, learning about cardiology. Um, so we had like the standard models, you know, and, and flipping through um, atlases to try to understand uh, the, the, the different views. And, and it's sort of interesting. I think showing these models, I think, to, to students, they're like, oh, wow, you know, suddenly, you know, I, I think, you know, they, 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 they understand so much more. I
uh, I keep making these models, we could have a library of all these complex cases that any medical student could think of. Uh, in simple terms, if I were to upload this to a website and give access to everyone for them to download and see it, it would be a great resource for learning as well. I think this is this is very exciting. I think from an educator standpoint, uh, and I'd say you know even for um, uh, developing new therapies for patients. So so that there are, there are a lot of areas that um, that this technology can go. And again, we're only using it for those that have more pr clearly unusual anatomy. Um, but I can envision a day where the technology is so prevalent that really every every surgery would just like most surgeons get a CAT scan or an MRI, most surgeons would get modeled to, to look at and no one would say, oh, I don't need to look at it. Well, why not take a feel and take a look because surgery, surgery is very three-dimensional. I think we are very fortunate to, to have the kind of collaboration we have here in SLU Care among physicians from different departments, but not just SLU Care. This project goes beyond, goes to the, uh, to the undergraduate campus. We are collaborating with the School of Engineering. As uh, we tackle more complicated health problems, it requires this collaborative effort from radiologists, and internal medicine specialists, and pediatricians, and surgeons, and so on, to try to get the outcomes that uh, we feel like we should get. This couldn't have happened outside. The partnership is happening because at SLU everybody helps other people out so we don't look at what's in it for us so it's a community and uh, it really helped to bring the project really well in one year PS. It is great to be part of the SLU Care fraternity because we have so many brilliant minds uh, when we sit together we talk about it uh, they come up with ideas that are very challenging and then uh, it, that helps us move on further and innovate more. I feel like every doctor that we have met has been so compassionate and so caring. It's unreal. I mean, we go in there, they know Braden's name, they know our names. We'll walk down the hall for an appointment and they're like, oh, how's Bristol? How's her heart? Or, you know, everybody knows. You just feel family there. This is just the beginning. We're at a ground floor with this right now. It'll expand over time. We'll just, it'll mushroom, we'll watch it happen. 3D printing and 3D related printed technologies will become more and more prevalent and surgeons will come to accept them more. They will say, wow, this is really helping me visualize something that I understood, but boy, the, the level of understanding, the level of confidence we have to give to the patient is really beyond what we had before. We've only really just scratched the surface of what can be done. It is cutting edge, yeah. It's innovative, it's cutting edge, and it has real benefit. And uh, I think really that, that that does represent the future. It does uh, humble you because, it, you know, you, you don't realize how much you can help someone. And it gives you a good feeling that you are able to make a difference by uh, making these models, something that you enjoy making. Uh, and then it is helpful to a patient.